again for being here. Um, the first slide you see is our introduction. So again, my name is Michelle Muro. I am the collections coordinator here at the Homestead Museum. Um, the image you see is a panorama, one of the many photographs that we have in our collection of uh, the Merchants um, and Manufacturing Association, their annual banquet dated uh, 1923 at the Ambassador Hotel. Unfortunately, it's no longer standing. Uh, but this panorama is just to give you an idea of um, one of the many types of photos that we have in our collection. Um, let's see, okay. Next slide. So our topics for today, just to give you a rundown of what I will be discussing, um, environmental factors that cause damage to your photographs, such as light, um, humidity and temperature. Um, let's see, the overexposure to light is one of the most detrimental factors. So we're gonna, we will be just discussing uh, a multiple um, uh, factors that cause damage to photos. Um, simple and effective pres preservation procedures and what you can do. Um, most people think you need to have a degree uh, to do the most basic procedures, but thankfully um, you can take some steps that are at the very basic level to really help preserve your photographs and give it that longevity that it needs. Um, and distinctions between curators, preservation specialists, and conservators. Um, there's distinct um, differences between the two professions. And when to call a conservator, um, and what to expect and what to be ready for, and helpful online resources for more preservation information. And as Isis uh, stated, uh, we will have time for Q&A for questions and answers. Okay. Moving on. So proper handling. Now this may seem like a no brainer, but you will be surprised at the damage that can be done on a photograph when um, when it's not handled properly. So what do I mean by proper handling? Well, um, the use of both hands, uh, holding a photograph by its edges and being very careful about that. Okay. Use of two hands. Okay. And it's best to use two hands, hold the corners, avoid, avoiding the um, image area as much as you can. Um, and if the edges are worn down, there are such things as acid-free paper triangles that can be safely used on those edges. Now, glove types. As you can see on the screen here, the first image is uh, cotton gloves, and then you have your nitro gloves. Now, it is extremely important to remember um, that glove use is one of the best things you can do before handling um, an object and while handling an object. And why is that? Well, we all have natural oils on our hands um, that is wonderful for our skin, but detrimental preservation wise for photos. It's cumulative and so over time it'll wear down um, the image and uh, cause a rapid rate of deterioration. So there's two gloves that um, we recommend for um, handling uh, photos and the cotton gloves and the nitro gloves. Now the cotton gloves, the pros of the cotton gloves is that they are reusable and they're cost effective. You can wash them and have a set for a long time. In fact, we have um, cotton gloves that we have uh, used and washed and we have for years and they're pretty good. Of course, they do wear down. They, they do um, uh, tend to tear at times, but that's, that's to be expected, but they do last longer than nitrile gloves. The downside about these cotton gloves is that you tend to lose dexterity. What, what exactly does that mean? Uh, you lose the sensation in your fingers, so it's easier to damage an object if it's 
brittle. Now that's why you have nitro gloves. Now nitro gloves, you also lose some dexterity, but you can retain some more feeling um, when you use nitro gloves. Um, the exception to this rule is if you are handling, uh, let's say, a glass negative, so uh, or, or a tin type, and it, a tin type is not encased, so it's bare. So, and in that case, I would suggest not to use gloves, and um, simply because it can slip out of your hands and it can fall to the floor and it could break. Um, so that's the only exception to that rule. Okay. Moving on. So one of the um, environmental factors that are highly detrimental is light. In fact, light is probably the worst type of damage that can um, overcome an object like a photograph uh, because it's irreversible. So even if you sought the help of a conservator, a photo conservator, uh, typically, it's not, you're not able to restore an image. Um, so light, um, overexposure to natural and artificial light is highly detrimental. Um, so because of, of that, I do suggest as well as other, there's other museums that do this, um, not just for their photo um, exhibits, but for many other type of objects, is to limit the display time. Now I understand we're talking about your your um, images maybe of your um, ancestors, your family members that are always up on the wall. Um, and you really don't want to not display them. So there, there, are, there are alternatives to do that. Um, so consider making a copy of your original um, and putting away that original and just displaying your copy. Um, there's also framing um, alternatives to glass. Glass frames that you can find anywhere um, that we all use to um, place our photographs and display them. Glass is not something that will help prevent the UV rays of the sun from penetrating through and weakening your um, photo and discoloring it. Um, so I do suggest um, alternatives, and those are alternatives would be acrylic glazing, UV filtered acrylic glazed um, alternative to glass. So that can be found online, uh, and I will speak more about resources such as Gaylord Archival, University Products um, to consider. Okay, and other preventative measures to consider is maybe if you don't want to um, display a copy and you want your original, which is totally understandable in view, um, consider moving the photograph away from uh, direct lighting, away from a window, uh, perhaps somewhere where there's not, uh, where it's dimly lit usually, where the sun doesn't hit it as much. Now, damage that's caused over time to overexposure, whether it's natural or artificial light, can range from fading. And this beautiful photograph you see here on the, um, on the screen is of what we know of the Sanchez family who resided in the city of Boyle Heights during the 1920s. So they're posed in front of their car and what we presume to be their home as well. So back to damage. So you can see that the image is quite different in its hue, in its color. Uh, that to me tells me that this uh, particular photo has been overexposed to lighting, whether it's artificial or um, natural, because of its discoloration. So that's one of the damage types that will be encountered is discoloration of your photo, photo whether it's yellowing, uh, darkening of any kind, browning, um, and fading. And the worst uh, type of damage is sometimes complete bleached. Uh, uh, the image is completely gone because of the severity of exposure to sunlight. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay.
Now we're moving on, next slide. So temperature and uh, relative humidity. Um, so first let's talk about what humidity really is, very basic. It is the amount of moisture in any given environment. Now, sometimes if it's too high or too low um, and those fluctuations are severe, that's what really causes a lot of other issues, especially for paper and photo um, objects. So the recommended levels, if you can control the temperature and humidity. So the temperature for, to give you an example, at the Homestead Museum, because we have a mixed collection, is between 68 to 72 degrees, with that uh, variance between 68 to 72 degrees. Recommended humidity levels should never surpass 50 to 55 percent, simply because when you go above 55 percent, headed towards 60 percent relative humidity, that is an environment that is welcoming spores to attach to the surface of objects, furniture, anything else, and it, it welcomes mold, and that's an issue, of course. So damage caused by high and low fluctuations. So when there's too much humidity in um, any given environment, and we're talking about photographs, that will cause swelling, it can cause um, uh, damage and warping, and then when there's too low of a uh, relative humidity, it can cause contraction, it could cause um, embrittlement, thereby causing tears, and it's just a weakening overall of the particular photograph. Um, to regulate temperature and humidity, we have images that you see here on this slide. The first one is of a small little reader, which is a reader that um, senses temperature as well as um, humidity. So this particular reader um, was in one of the bedrooms upstairs um, in our, one of our historic homes called La Casa Nueva. It was built in the 1920s and it's a Spanish colonial revival home. Okay. Now these readers are available online. Uh, primarily I've seen them a lot, uh, more of a selection on Amazon. So they're pretty um, affordable. Now the second image you see is of a portable AC unit. That particular AC unit is uh, Avalon and then you see a dehumidifier on the floor. It's Eva, Eva Pro. Those Eva Pros were also purchased, not on Amazon, but a uh, place like Merit's or Lowe's or Home Depot. And then damp reds there, that is something you can consider to regulate um, humidity. So regulating humidity, we have the uh, dehumidifier there in the middle of the screen next to the AC unit, and then you have the damp red. The damp reds are more effective in small um, areas like closet spaces and bathrooms, depending on the size of your bathrooms. Um, now, the dehumidifiers usually last several years, are pretty effective, but again, you have to take into account where your photos are stored um, and take into account the room size. Um, damp reds are pretty good. Um, you can reuse a canister. The only thing is the um, granules that suck up the moisture and turn into liquid um, have to be dumped out periodically, so that's not reusable. And the temperature and humidity readers last for about a year or so, and then you have to change and probably special order um, a cell battery, but they're all pretty effective. All of those are pretty effective. So the uh, portable AC unit, of course, is to control the temperature. The dehumidifier is to lower um, the uh, relative humidity levels as well as the damp reds. Now what you don't want is that fluctuation. So all of those items are going to help stabilize your temperature and humidity. So what you would want is a stable um, temperature and humidity with low fluctuations and to monitor that temperature and humidity range by using those readers. Okay. Move 
moving on. Good housekeeping. Yikes, housekeeping. <laughs> I think we're all doing a little more of that during quarantine. But um, good housekeeping is essential. And it is part of um, IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management. Now, what is IPM? Basically, IPM is a systematic approach that implements practices um, such as good housekeeping to prevent or control pest infestation. Um, accumulation of dust, dirt, and debris will, as we all know, invite uh, pests like cockroaches, rodents, um, and other pests that are very detrimental to um, a collection of photographs. So that's essential to keep in mind. Um, we're talking about your basic uh, vacuuming of floors, dusting of surfaces, that should suffice. Now again, yes, a buildup of dust can cause damage to photographs. Now let's talk about that damage. Um, we don't often think of dust as a factor in causing damage to an object, but over time, if left um, on the surface, it can embed itself and uh, cause issues like abrasion damage, which is a, a wearing down of the superficial surface of photographs, especially um, prints. Um, and it, they do attract pests, but we'll talk more about that in a little while. Now, what to do about that? Um, to clean a photo, uh, to dust a photo, it's very simple. All you need is um, the use of a soft bristle brush. I recommend brushes called Haki, H-A-K-E, and they are bambooed uh, handle, just like you see there in the image. And they are very soft because they, they are made out of uh, sheep, um, sheep hairs. So it's not abrasive. It won't hurt the surface of your photographs. And they're quite effective. And believe it or not, there's a technique um, to uh, brushing off your photos. So what you would want to do is start in the middle, the center of your photo, and sweep toward the edge. You start top to bottom until it's completely uh, cleaned of superficial dirt and, and dust, and you do that toward the other side. So the complete surface of the photo is clean. Okay, now we're moving on. Next slide. Oops. Bear with me, folks. <laughs> so common pests, yes. Common pests. So the image you see here is of a lovely, lovely silverfish. Um, so silverfish are attracted to not only um, photo emulsions, but also paper. So anything paper-based, they attack. Um, so it's not just silverfish, but paper lice. Now paper lice um, are, uh, tend to look like very small. They're in fact much smaller than silverfish. Um, they're quite tiny um, and they're about, uh, they're probably like a brownish, they come in different colors. They're brownish white and they do have six legs. Um, so they're one of the crawl, crawling insects, pests. And then you also have to take note of, um, let's see, rodents uh, and cockroaches. Um, and they love to graze on the top layers of paper and, and, and photos. Although it's not that common to have, um, say, paper lice completely eat all of an image, they certainly will cause enough damage where you might um, lose the image itself. Um, so they may not eat the entire piece, but you will definitely see um, the grazing marks that um, will destroy the image itself. Now the presence of spiders is interesting because although spiders are not detrimental to say a historic collection, you would want to take note if you see um, an, influx of spider population around your home or inside your home. Spiders don't affect a historic collection, but spiders will uh, make their way toward areas that have a food supply and they will eat pests that are harmful to your collection, such as silverfish and, and uh, paper lice. 
So that's something to take note. Um, and the environment in which these pests, uh, particularly silverfish, uh, paper lice, rodents, cockroaches are attracted to are areas in which are very dark, which is strange because you technically want your photos to be stored in a dark place, but they have to be uh, in an area where it's really damp. So that's what attracts um, these pests in damp, dark places. So that's why it's so important to watch out for the humidity levels um, um, when you are storing uh, photos um, long term in the area. Um, so we talked about damage caused by pests. Let me see here. Okay, so I think we'll move on to the next slide, which will talk more about pests. Now, part of integrated uh, pest management is not just monitoring and knowing what to look for in terms of uh, pests that are a threat to your collection of photos, but it's also a plan of action and, and, and a plan of um, monitoring. So what is essential, of course, is good housekeeping. So again, it's your basic dusting of surfaces, vacuuming, sweeping, um, and then it is tracking the temperature and relative humidity to make sure that these book lice or paper lice and silverfish um, are not attracted to the area in which your, your images are stored. Um, usually when you have an infestation of paper lice, um, I have read in studies that it is enough to put in a dehumidifier, vacuum everything up, um, and that usually takes care of the infestation. But if you have any more questions, please feel free to um, email me and I can guide you through and connect you to people who um, deal with pest infestations. And um, I can connect you to, to those folks to help you um, if you need that help. Okay, now the use of traps. So what we see here on the left is a non-sticky trap. There's no particular brand that I recommend. You can go online, you can be, they can be found um, in hardware stores like Merritt's, Lowe's, Home Depot, and they're great because they are non-toxic, but they do help you uh, to monitor what type of pests you have. So you see there's a spider there, common uh, house spider, not a big deal um, at that time. Um, so that really, the non-sticky traps do kill these pests. Um, and they also, but most importantly, help you to monitor to see what type of issue you may have in the area in which you store your photographs. Now, silverfish, um, usually if you see one, it's not a big deal, but typically if you see one, there are many others. So if you start to um, see them crawling in places like closet spaces, then deco packs are usually something that you can use. Um, in fact, our pest management um, company that comes in and uh, helps us with uh, pest control um, gave us, uh, uh, we purchased some of these deco packs. Um, so a word of caution, extreme caution, before you use something like these silverfish packs, please, please, read the instructions carefully because they do have boric acid that is what kills the silverfish so they're attracted to the paper in which the boric acid is in and they eat the first layer which they usually do they graze the first layer of paper instead of your photo or paper objects and the boric acid is ingested and they, they do die but please keep out of uh keep these out of reach of children or pets okay so let's see. Also, um, yes, yeah, so lower your humidity in those areas. Remove any standing bodies of water that you may have that you're not aware of. Um, the pests usually go where there is um, plenty of water. So use your dehumidifiers and also check for um, any areas of points of entry like uh, cracks um, um, in your windows, uh, crevices near entry points, make sure all of that is taken care of as well. Okay. Now housing type. 
Okay, this is interesting because um, there are different types of photographs, especially if you're um, dealing with photos from the 19th and 20th centuries, 18 to 1900s respectively. Um, so this image here is of a tintype and it was, it's of, uh, of a young man. Uh, we're not sure in terms of the provenance, we don't know who he was, but we do know um, that it was from about the 1860s that this image was taken. Now, tintypes are usually encased, so they're like daguerreotypes. They look like they're on a glass type of surfaces. So this is one of the type of images that you would want to hold ungloved, um, holding the corners. Um, if you do use gloves and you hold this image, um, there's a chance that you can, um, it, it can slip from your hands. Um, so this tintype, as you see here, is housed um, using a special type of foam called ethafoam. And usually ethafoam is polypropylene based and it's very soft and it comes in rolls. Um, so it's very economical, though the rolls are a little bit expensive. So he is placed in this ethafoam and we actually measured out its um, dimension so that it fits nicely inside, secure. And ethafoam, what it does is usually it's used in uh, instances like this to uh, cradle a uh, delicate object, or it can be used for shipping objects if you have to ship an object outside of your museum or outside of uh, your place. Uh, they usually absorb shock, so they're pretty good for um, uh, transportation of objects. So you see the ethafoam there, and then you see these ties here. They're called cotton twill tape. Now don't be confused with the word tape. That there is nothing adhesive about the uh, twill tape. Um, they're cotton ties, but they're called cotton twill tape. And they're used to secure, just like you see here, um, the image um, in place. Now, what you see coming out of it is a really great idea. And that is, so instead of digging in and maybe scratching the um, image, you simply use that little uh, end of that twill tape to lift it gently. So that way you can um, be sure you're not um, adding to damage like abrasions or scratches to your image. And the box itself is a special box and we'll talk more about that, but it is basically an acid-free box um, from um, a museum resource that I will talk more about. There are, many, there are many different resources that you can order your housing materials that are safe and we'll talk more about that too. So basically housing type also de really depends on the um, size of your image. Uh, usually it's easily found um, boxes, envelopes, um, sizes that range from five by sevens to eight by tens to 11 by 15s. Now, anything larger than an 11 by 15, usually you will have to have custom made, um, but that's easy enough to do and I can talk more about that as well. Um, so uh, basically, we're going to get more into the housing type, but again, you would want to take note of the size of your object, 5 by 7, roughly 8 by 10, 11 by 15 of the photograph. And usually, um, it's more rare to have tintypes and daguerreotypes, so anything that looks like it's glass-based, um, images. More so we have, I see, um, prints, like some 1920s photographic prints or 1970s prints. Um, so all of those you would theoretically would just want um, a folder. If you can only afford a, an, an envelope, acid-free envelope, to store an image in there, that's a great thing to do. Um, but we'll talk more in detail about the different types of enclosures and what we use, but what you can use as well. Okay, so um, the enclosures are divided up between paper and plastics. We'll talk more about the plastics. It's not the plastic that you can get, you know, from Tupperware plastics. It's a special 
type of plastic. In fact, there's three types of plastics, but we'll talk more about that later. So we're talking about paper enclosures right now. So these are the, the key terms you would want to look for when you're um, ordering your housing enclosures if they're paper. So usually when you order from places like Gaylord Archival University products, which are all going to be noted um, at the end of the slide, so that way I'll have that up for you so you can see what resources you can choose from. Uh, they all are highly trusted resources that um, have all passed the photographic activity test and it says past. So that's something that you want to make sure that um, you look for when you are purchasing these housing materials. Um, let's see here. So basically, um, PAT um, is an international study um, that tests and focuses on the chemical interaction between an object that is housed inside those materials long term. So it's an actual scientific study that has been conducted to see the effects of any given enclosure, especially if it's considered something that's archival friendly or museum friendly. So it's a, it's a study that has been done um, to show whether or not it's an effective enclosure to and if it's safe to um, house your images. So something else you would want to note are terms such as acid-free, linen-free. So acid-free basically means the pH, the level of acidity, is at seven. So at seven, it's considered pH neutral. So that means it's free from any acidic content that might harm your photo in the long term. Linen-free also it has to do with acidity, but it's the removal of naturally occurring wood pulp in any paper-based enclosure. Um, and that also aids in the, the neutral, nice pH level for a photograph. Um, buffered versus non-buffered. Now, recent studies have shown that photographs do well in either or, buffered or non-buffered. But there are exceptions to this rule and another slide I, I will uh, discuss about this as well. But um, buffer basically means there's a, an added agent such, it's an alkaline such as calcium carbonate or chalk added into the process of making an enclosure. Now what this means is that the calcium carbonate helps to mitigate the transfers of acids if you have multiple images in one enclosure, or it helps to mitigate the acid that can be formed over time because of the calcium carbonate, right, the alkaline. Um, now, non-buffered means just that, that there's no added agent, no added alkaline um, to the enclosure. So I always stress, if you're not sure, you are safe to just go with the non-buffered um, enclosures. But if you go on websites like Gaylord Archival University Products, and it's a very helpful tab that you just click on for photographs, usually they are buffered. But there's an exception to this rule. And there's an image type called a cenotype. Now, the cenotypes um, were created um, in the 1840s and were not popular until the 1880s, thereabouts, in the United States. But they have a distinct blue hue. So, and they kind of look like blueprints, architectural blueprints, because the process is the same, except that these cenotype images usually are of landscape images and, and people as well. So typically, it's, it's not too common to see cenotypes. I have seen them. We do have them in our collection. Um, if you have those, if you have an image that has a blue hue, you would always want to um, purchase enclosures that are non-buffered. The buffered, the alkaline for some reason, the calcium carbonate in buffered enclosures has an adverse reaction to the, um, the hues in um, cenotypes. So if you have an image, again, that is a blue color, 
you go with non-buffered enclosures. And if you're just not sure, non-buffered is the way to go, okay? So we also have enclosures that are folders and boxes, so they're considered paper enclosures. And like I've mentioned before, the, um, some of the major suppliers are um, university products, uh, let's see, Gaylor Archival, and um, there, are, there are more. So I will talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Oh, also, there is a way to test to see what the level of acidity is on any given paper enclosure. So if you're not sure because there's not enough funds and you just needed to buy a paper enclosure, but you weren't sure what the acidity level is, there is a pH pen that you can order online. And they're kind of like the pens that, you know, when we go and make a major purchase, so we have to use like a $50 bill, $100 bill, and the cash register person um, marks the bill to see if it's an actual um, bill. That's kind of the same idea with the pH pen. Um, so it'll change colors depending on the acidity level. So I think high acidity might be like yellow. So then you know you have a choice whether you want to risk putting your photo in that paper enclosure. And if it's a blue hue, I think that means it's a, a good, at a good level, but I have to double check. But they're called pH pens. So pH is basically the measurement of acidity in an enclosure. So that, that might be helpful to somebody out there. Okay. Moving on, now plastic enclosures. I always get nervous when I talk about, whoops, these plastic enclosures. Um, I don't want you to think that Tupperware and any type of plastic is good to go. It's not. Um, there are some specific plastic types that are safe to use. Okay, so currently there are three um, plastic enclosures um, and sleeves considered safe for long-term use. And th the first one is polyester. Polyester is, for me, I highly recommend it in my 13 years of experience and working with uh, photographs. I recommend polyester. Why is that? Well, let's talk about polyester. Sleeving. So you see this image. First of all, let's talk about the image. So the image here is of a wedding couple. Uh, circa 18, 1885. Um, provenance is not known. We just know they're obviously um, taking a wedding photo. Um, and the photographer was in Los Angeles. So it's an 1885 cabinet card. Um, cabinet cards are usually something that we see during this time, very popular form of photography. So it's the um, photo image and then the backing is made out of uh, paper, cardboard. So you can see that it's inside this see-through plastic. That's polyester. So polyester, um, the name for that that you can see um, or you can find commonly, um, it's called Melanex. So polyester's um, good points are that it's clear, so you can hold the image and without gloves because the object, the photo is inside the plastic sleeve. So it's protecting it from dust, your oils on your hands. Okay, so it's clear, smooth and rigid and it gives support while handling and it's good for visibility. Um, an old familiar form of polyester was mylar type D, but unfortunately that has been discontinued. But I do recommend polyester based plastic sleeves. Um, which are now called Melanex. That's M as in Mary, E-L-I-N-E-X, Melanex, okay? Other types of plastics, so uh, is polypropylene. So polypropylene is uncoated and it's a low cost alternative to polyester. Polyester is more expensive out of the three because um, it provides so much for um, an object for a photo. Um, so polypropylene is uncoated and it's low cost alternative to polyester. It is less rigid though, um, but it's still clear and use, you can use this for photos that don't need support are in really good condition. So for instance, if, if uh, funding was an issue, I would have ordered polypropylene sleeves instead of um, 
polyester melanex sleeves, okay? Because that particular photograph is in good condition. It's stable and it doesn't really need added support, okay? So the last one is polyethylene. Polyethylene is the most soft of the three plastics, um, but it is less clear. Um, it has a smooth surface, um, but you can use if clarity and rigidity support is not needed for the photo. So let's recap real quickly. Polyester is the best one, in my opinion, uh, Melanex, then polypropylene, and then it's polyethylene. So those three are currently um, the recommended uh, plastic type of enclosures for photographs. Um, they also come in envelopes. So there's different types of envelopes. There are um, envelopes that have a lip like you see here. So they open with the lip up secured. And then there are also envelopes that don't have a lip to like a seal over it um, that you can just easily open um, like a pamphlet. Okay. Let's go on. Housing locations. Okay. I like talking about housing locations. Okay, so recommended locations for storage. So let's first talk about the image you see here. This is actually a bedroom closet uh, that belonged to one of the sons of the man that owned the 1920s mansion that is part of our historic site in La Casa Nueva. This is Thomas's bedroom. Now, as you can see here, I have um, objects here. I don't have photographs, but I do have other objects in here, such as textiles, which are anything cloth-based, so like uh, pants, trousers, um, well, pants, trousers, um, shirts, vests, and other um, objects in here. But um, the reason why I chose this image is because most of us at home have closets, right? And in fact, closet spaces, if they're in a centralized location within a home, are the best places to store photographs. If you are not a museum with an HVAC system running all the time, meaning you have a heating, air conditioning, ventilation system running all the time, um, closet spaces, believe it or not, are um, known to have more of a stable temperature and humidity ranges than any other parts of a home. Um, so that is uh, what is recommended. Um, I do recommend if you have a uh, shelf space to spare, if you have, depending on the size of your collection, your photo collection though, but if you have maybe one box of photos, of family photos, um, I recommend using uh, one of the shelves to store your photos, always at a higher level than the ground. Why? Because the um, crawling insects won't get to it as easily, okay? Though silverfish do crawl on the walls, it won't be as easy for them to get to your, your photos. Um, also, in case there's flooding, um, you would want your, your images up high, okay? Now, um, let's see here. If space is an issue and you can't use your um, shelving areas, at least try to have the images um, a foot away from the floor and you're in good shape. Now the areas to avoid. So areas to avoid are attics, basements, as well as garages. Now the reason for this is because usually in attics, basements, and garages, the temperature and the humidity fluctuation is so high that it goes high to high, very high levels to low levels. And that is, as we talked about, highly detrimental to photographs, causing a lot of damage to them, um, especially attics. So if you have a closet space and, and there's, you have space to spare, a closet is the best location um, or a cabinet. Um, in a centralized location in your home. Okay. Now materials to avoid. Oops. Sorry guys. Sorry folks. Let's go back. Materials to avoid um, are certain photo album types. Now those photo album types um, are usually called magnetic 
photo albums. I'm going to age myself here, but um, I have some images. Uh, my childhood and um, these images, I have to figure out a way to remove them. Now, basically what these magnetic um, photo albums are, there's no magnets involved. Really what it is, is um, uh, the um, photo album has rigid um, cardboard pages and they have literally ridges on them. But there's a type of adhesive that's present on the surface and that's what holds your photographs in place over highly acidic plastic. So these were extremely, extremely popular during the 1970s, 80s. Um, I haven't seen them since, but I think they're still out there. So that's something to avoid. Um, you certainly don't want to house anything in a highly acidic environment or have any adhesives, any tapes or glues to your backing of your photos, okay? Rubber bands, um, staples, paper clips, unstable plastic enclosures, adhesives and inks. Um, so let's talk about rubber bands. Rubber bands, um, I have seen uh, photos tied together in rubber bands before, and rubber bands um, age, they degrade horribly. I've seen some of them um, melt and stick to images and where that rubber band was stuck to an image, that section of the image was lost completely. And it causes stains also, so that's something to avoid. Now staples, paper clips can tarnish and that can stain an image as well. Um, unstable plastic enclosures, um, plastics that are not polyethylene, polypropylene, um, polyester, those are to be avoided. So like your Tupperwares or anything you see like at the 99 cent store, um, please try to stay away from those particular enclosures. If you can't avoid that, um, at least have your images in acid-free um, uh, folders or acid-free envelopes and um, you should be fine. But it's best to try to stay away from unstable plastic enclosures that are not purchased from a trusted source or that you know for sure is not polyester, polypropylene, and polyethylene. Now adhesives or inks, um, the rule of thumb here, well for museum professionals, is we cannot apply anything to an object that is not reversible. So everything we do to an object has to be reversible. Now I understand that we're mostly talking about uh, photographs that are in your own collection, your, your own photos of your family and friends, um, but that is something to keep in mind. Um, adhesives and inks are, uh, specifically inks, are usually um, permanent. Although you can probably find a photo conservator that might be able to help to remove inks on the image, it's quite expensive. So it's best to avoid that if all possible. Okay. Now the importance of digitizing. So first let's talk about um, what really digitizing is. It simply means to convert an uh, image um, into a digital form. Now, why is that important? Well, we know that originals and objects will slowly degrade depending on their composition, whether it's rapid uh, deterioration or slow deterioration. Eventually, it will deteriorate. And something might happen, um, goodness forbid, a fire or a, let's say um, a leaky pipe and um, the images are ruined. So what you would wanna always keep in mind is to digitize your collection so you have a copy somewhere stored um, digitally of your original. So you can uh, display your copy and not worry about it degrading because you can always make another copy. Um, but your original is priceless. So that is something to consider. And then also it monitors the condition over time. So you can do this simply by using your cell phone using your cell phone um, camera to uh, capture the images of your um, collection and then going back and over time monitor, monitoring your original by looking at the uh, photo that you took of it five years ago. And if you start seeing signs of degradation, you know, deterioration, then you know something's going on. You can make, form a plan of action. 
Now, this is something new, apps that may help. Um, I have to uh, um, specify here that I haven't used any apps that are downloadable, but I have heard from others within the field um, that apps like Heritage Box, Photomine, um, are easy to download from the Play Store on your phone if you have an Android or whatever phone you have, whatever Play Store it is, you can download these apps and they actually help to digitize, they guide you step by step to digitize your, your images. Um, so if you don't want to take the time to get a, a digital camera, which is something else you can do, or you need more help with um, storing them, they store them on a cloud. But I believe Photo Mine um, and Heritage Box, you have to pay a fee. I'm not sure if it's per month, but that's something that I thought I'd share since um, there are folks in my field that um, recommended that. But again, I haven't used it, but it's something that might might be helpful to somebody out there. Okay, and the image you see here, it's not quite a cabinet card. Um, it's fairly large um, and it is an image of a group of people. Unfortunately, we don't know who these folks are, but they are standing in front of um, a building. We assume it's a church. And this particular um, uh, image was taken um, about 1915. So, um, you can see that it's worn down as well. You can see the discoloration on it. So um, this is something that arrived to us in this condition, but um, having uh, a photo documentation of it will help me uh, to see if there's any issues down the line. Okay. All right. Curator versus conservator. I don't want to insult anybody who, who are very much aware of these terms, but I thought it would be helpful just to go over some of these uh, specific distinctions in um, the museum world and the profession. Now, a curator preservation specialist. I am a collections coordinator. No, I don't collect debt. Um, so basically what collections coordinator translates to is curator. Um, I am a curator and a preservation specialist, so I am in charge of documenting, cataloging, as well as my assistant. I have um, someone who works with me, thank goodness, in this field. Um, so what curators basically do is we are essentially the custodian of a historic cultural collection. Um, and we theoretically should uh, have some training to know the basics of preservation when it comes to housing materials, uh, locations, environmental factors. We're responsible for exhibiting, cataloging, housing, monitoring for damage and other threats to the collection. Um, so uh, that's a basic rundown of what a curator does. Um, I do have some training in, and certification in uh, certain conservation, preservation procedures for textiles, but I also, because I have experience with a wide range of object types, I do have that um, specialty uh, for preservation. Now, conservators, conservators should have the same skill set as a preservation specialist. But conservators um, are people who can restore and repair damage that are already present on objects. So they are, of course, are also experts on the basics of preservation. Um, but there are different distinct types of conservators. So because we're talking about photos, you would want a photo conservator. You wouldn't want um, a sculpture or art conservator. You would want a photo conservator that has gone to school, many years of training, um, many years of scientific study to know what type of um, chemicals if need be to, to be used to restore an object, what to do um, for the photos. So there is a distinct um, difference. Now, so curators, think of us and preservation specialists, we're your primary care doctors. So we're your preventative medicine, right? We, we, we are guiding you to prevent the need for a conservator because by the time an object goes to a conservator, that means more um, in-depth um, repair is needed. So conservators are like your surgeons. <laughs> 
I found that helpful. So I hopefully, hopefully you all find that helpful too. So curators and preservation specialists were your primary care doctors, <laughs> preventative uh, medicine, conservators are your surgeons, okay? Now consultation differs. Um, so conservators are usually, uh, I'm not too much aware of curators and preservation specialists as uh, um, businesses that have consultation, although I, I can uh, um, consult others, but conservators, um, the consultation is, um, there is a fee and conservators are quite expensive to hire um, um, and it's because of the in-depth work that they do so um, as well. So we will move on. Okay, so when to call a conservator? Now we're talking about photographs. So if your photo is faded um, and you need it to be restored, or there's um, your photo is adhered to glass or a photo album, um, and you can't seem to um, remove it without damaging the image. If there's tears that need to be mended, ink on the photos that need to be removed, cracks on glass, like uh, daguerreotypes or uh, cracks on tintypes, um, photos affected by fire or water damage, that's when you call a conservator. Uh, what to expect and how to prepare. Now, this is extremely important. Um, what to expect, uh, conservators will either give a free consultation or they may charge you for the consultation. Um, but conservators should provide their clients with a detailed condition report, uh, condition report of the current state of your photo. And they will create a proposed treatment before any um, work is done um, and reasons why their treatment is acceptable. So they have to basically put in their arguments as to why their chosen mode of treatment is appropriate to restore your photograph. So before they do anything to your photo, you, you have to be able to read along the, um, read these reports and decide whether or not this is something appropriate for you. And then it should also have an estimate, of course, of time it will take and cost estimate. So before anything is done, then you would sign, of course, just like any legal document, then the, the work will commence. Um, but something to keep in mind, conservators um, should be upfront with uh, their clients if an object is beyond repair. Sometimes, even if you find a conservator, sometimes the damage is so far gone that they will tell you, they should be able to tell you if it's beyond their help. Um, so that's that. And they should also uh, be able to provide a final report that may have slight changes if there is any changes whatsoever done for the uh, preservation and repair, conservation procedural or repair work done on your uh, particular image. Okay. Now, online resource to find a conservator is through American Institute for Conservation, AIC. Um, I know it's a little confusing, but it's AIC, but you will find their particular site through the uh, www.culturalheritage.org. And then you click on there, find a conservator, and then you can find um, distinct type of conservators, whether it's photo, textile, glass, um, taxidermy, um, experts. So that is that. This image here, oh before I go, is of a 1920s pamphlet and I had to remove some rusted staples on there and rebind with special threading. So that is something that I do here at the museum. Okay, moving on. So here's the, uh, the um, slide for online resources and information. I have found that these websites, the first three for um, preservation, are excellent, especially the conservagrams. Um, when I was a new museum professional, conservagrams were just the best. Um, and for also further learning, um, further enrichment, um, 
in the world of preservation, curatorial world. So conservagrams are great. So is the Library of Congress, and they have different types of preservation-based um, leaflets that range from different object types. Northeast Document Conservation Center also is really really good. So if you need more information, um, if I didn't address any um, questions, which I hopefully will today, but if you need more information, please go on those websites and they should um, hopefully be of great help to you. Now sources for housing materials. Um, there's Gaylord Archival, University Products, Archival Methods, and Hollinger Metal Edge. We utilize uh, Gaylord Archival University Products Hollinger Metal Edge. I have ordered some objects uh, or housing um, materials from Archival Methods, so they're all really good. Um, so uh, Hollinger Metal Edge is where we order most, of, if not all, our box enclosures, so they're really great. Now what's good about Hollinger Metal Edge um, is that not only can you order stuff online, but you can actually go to the store. I believe it's in the city of Comrus, though right now, of course, given the pandemic, it might not be open, but um, they do have a physical store for those of you who are not interested in perusing online um, resources. They have a physical store you can visit. Um, and they, in fact, most all of these have um, catalogs that you can, you have to go online, but you can sign up with an email um, or a physical address and they'll send you a free catalog. So that's something to keep in mind if you don't want to go online too much. You can also have just a physical catalog. Okay. And then lastly, please feel free to use me as a source. That's why I'm here. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. If um, you don't have time to ask a question, I'm usually really good about responding to my emails. Um, so I am, again, my name is Michelle Muro, Collections Coordinator at m.muro at homesteadmuseum.org. Um, so feel free to email me and I will, I will be in touch. So everybody, I hope you have a good day. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, now is the time for Q&A. So I will um, be here to answer any and all of your questions. Yeah, so yeah, I have a lot of questions um, built up, so I'm going to go and deal with them. But if you haven't asked a question yet, go ahead and ask it either in the Q&A or in the chat. I'll get you. Um, Michelle, just so you're aware, we're still having echoing problems, so I am manually unmuting and muting you. So I will ask the question and then give me a hot second to unmute you before you answer. Um, so my first question that I have is from Tanya. I hope I'm saying that right. Wondering what you would recommend for old photos in an album where photos face each other directly on a page. Is there any type of paper you would recommend to place between pages? That's a good question. Um, I, I think I forgot to address this. Interleaving tissue paper. If you cannot remove your um, photos and they're facing each other, they're touching each other, use interleaving tissue. Now, I know one name of a tissue product is called Renaissance tissue, but if you go on the website and you look for um, interleaving tissue for photos, like for Gaylord Archival and University Products, they should come up with a Renaissance um, interleaving tissue. Now, again, be very careful though. If you have cenotypes, which are, again, those blue colored photos, you would want to make sure that the interleaving not buffered. That's the exception to the rule. So cenotype photos, the blue colored images have to have unbuffered, U-N-B-U-F-F-E-R-E-D. Otherwise, if they're not and they're prints, they're regular prints, they're black and whites or they're color prints, uh, buffered is okay to go. Uh, could you spell inner leaving, leaning out loud? <laughs> Lucky, sorry. This is one of those that I have to spell it out myself. <laughs> Interleaving. So it's I N T V I N G, interleaving tissue. 
or you can just um, look it up as uh, tissue for photos and that should suffice too. All right, uh, Kathy asks, how do you preserve those rolled photos, i.e. class photos, about three feet long? Wow, uh, three feet, oh, those panorama photos. Um, yes, so what you would want to do is you would want to special order um, acid-free folders, um, and that's really all you need is an acid-free folder. Um, to store that large panorama. If it's rolled though, that's a different issue. Depending, it's really hard though, if, without me seeing it. It depends on the condition of the panorama, the large size photo. If it's in good condition, what you can do is roll it out gently and put weights on it and leave it there for a couple of days so that it can slowly start to relax and um, have some kind of flat surface. But if it's torn, if it's embrittled, you might not want to flatten it out and you would have to um, consult a conservator at that point. But if it's in good condition and you can, it can be um, flattened, um, you, all you would really need is an acid-free folder. Okay, Anne asks, uh, is there a way to get your PowerPoint? Because um, she would like to print it out herself later. Absolutely. Email me. And I will be happy to um, um, email you the um, PowerPoint. Tracy asks, do you have some tips on how to safely remove an old photo from an older frame? Okay, um, that depends um, if it's adhered. So if, if the photo is stuck to the frame, I would not touch it because you can um, tear the emulsion, you can uh, ruin the, um, the image um, to the point of no, um, it's not repairable. So um, if you can, uh, if it's not adhered, I would get, um, so we have, um, it's a very thin like metal spatula that um, I would kind of lightly dig under to see if you can remove the photo, but if you can safely remove the photo, if it's not adhered, I would just um, just try to gently remove the backing of the um, frame and then try to slowly remove the photo. If you feel any resistance, I would not go any further. Clark asks, when you frame a photo, should the glass or acrylic not touch the photo? Absolutely. Um, there are what's called spacers. And um, if you go to Michael's, um, I believe they have them available, but I would trust more like a Gaylord Archival University products to find those spacers because they're actually acid-free spacers. So it's always important to make sure that the um, glass frame is not touching your, your photo, um, if at all possible. All right, Tracy says, awesome presentation. Thank you, Michelle. And then Kathy asks, do we need to put all photos in individual envelopes? Okay. <laughs> so my official curator hat on, yes. But that's ideal, okay? So ideally, let me give you two part answer. If you have the money, depending on how many photographs you have, ideally, yes, every photo should have their own individual envelope. However, if money is an issue, what you can do is put multiple photos, maybe depending on the thickness of it. So if we're talking about like a, a modern print that are very thin, um, I would put maybe three in there depending on the, on the size of the photo and interleave them with that tissue that we spoke about earlier. Um, However, one thing I do want to recommend is when you're looking at purchasing photos, um, make sure that there's at least one inch of uh, space between the edge of the envelope and the um, edge of the photo inside. So make sure that there's space in between so that way the photo is not smushed up against the inside of, a, of an envelope because that can cause damage such as abrasion or tears 
as well. So make sure that the edges of the images have space when it's inside of a photo, at least an inch of space. Um, so, but yes, ideally every photo should have its own envelope, but if not, you can store multiple photos in one envelope, but make sure you have interleaving tissue and it's not more than three uh, photos in one image. And just a follow-up question related to that, um, can the same thing with tissues in between be done in a box instead of an envelope? You can, yes, you can. Um, but uh, the box, I would, um, so for boxed items, I would only use boxed enclosures for um, multiple flat um, prints or for daguerreotypes or glass-based images, tintypes, um, with their own box inside of a larger box. But yes, if um, you can't afford to buy individual envelopes for prints and you put them inside the box lying horizontal, lying flat, then yes, your ne next best thing is to interleave them with tissue. Okay, a couple of follow-ups to that. Uh, I might be pronouncing this wrong, but as you'll ask horizontal or vertical, I believe you just said horizontal. Um, and then Kathy also asks back to back in an envelope, okay? Back to, oh, um, yes, but I would, to be safe, I would still use that tissue if you can afford it. Okay, and then from your earlier topic, Jennifer wants to know if an adhered photo can be removed from a frame by a conservator or is it a goner? Oh, absolutely not. Um, I think most of the time it is something a conservator can do, but again, um, you have to keep in mind that conservators are not magicians. <laughs> unfortunately, they don't have magic wands and neither do curators. Um, so there, are, unfortunately, may be times where a curator will say that it's just best to leave it as is um, in order to save your image. So again, this is where the digitizing comes into play. Um, I highly recommend before you even release your object to a conservator or any professional to take detailed photographs of your image. That way you, you have a, a photo, document, photo documentation of the condition that it was in before it left your care. And that way also you have a digitized copy for um, future use for preservation in case something happens, something adversely happens to your original. But no, it's not a far gone, not in all cases. It depends though. All right, so I have kind of a question from both Clark and Patricia and it's about digitizing. Oh, and Janet just asked the same thing. Um, so scanning versus photographing at digitizing as well as what kind of uh, equipment do you recommend for scanning and photographing? For scanning, a former colleague um, recently, well not recently, a former colleague um, gave me a really nice uh, report. She recommends Epson, E-P-S-O-N scanners. Um, I I'm not too savvy on Epson's. What we do have here at the homestead and what we I found it's been very useful and really great is um, are the um, Canons. Can so Canons and Epson's, um, I can vouch for Canons and my former colleague could vouch for Epson's. So there's two there. And do you have a pro or con versus when you take a photograph versus when you uh, scan them? So the pros for um, scanning, sometimes um, it's, it's more about the quality. So you can have like a higher DPI of a quality of the image um, versus uh, just a photo. But preservation wise, it's probably best just to take a photo. Depends on the condition of your photograph too. Um, sometimes photographs don't do well with the scanner um, scanner bed top line on, on it. So that's something that you need to consider is the condition of your object. So the safest bet is to um, photograph with your a digital camera or with your um, cell phone. But if it's in good condition, a scanner bed works pretty well. Again, we use scanner beds here at the homestead and it seems to work just fine too. 
Okay, Tanya says, thank you so much. Uh, Tracy asks, do color photos uh, be stored separately from black and white photos? Yes. Yes, and that's because of the chemical processes that are used to, um, that are the composition of the, the photograph that are used to develop is different. And you usually want to keep like with like when it comes to objects, uh, especially photographs. So separate those. So if you have like, say, glass uh, negatives, those should be stored on their own and they should be stored vertically, by the way. Glass negatives should be stored on their own and should be stored vertically. If you have uh, black and white photographs, they should be stored together. If you have color prints, they should be stored together, but not mixed. All right, Jennifer says, super helpful, thank you. And then Aziel asks, how do you store acid-free envelopes? Oh, good question. Um, well, I think, would be best is to store them. Um, we, how we store them at the museum is we store them in dark places that are cool and um, that are not subjected to too much sunlight. Uh, but theoretically, acid-free folders do the protecting. But that's a good question. But I would store them like um, maybe in the same space you store your, your photos, like in uh, closet spaces on a shelf somewhere that is cool and, um, and is relatively stable with temperature. So there's not too much humidity, not, it's not, the temperature's not going up and down. So a closet space is pretty good. Clark asks, uh, to what extent do you, if at all, restore damaged photos digitally with something like Photoshop? Um, I'm not too much aware of the Photoshop. I haven't had experience with um, restoring um, photos. Um, so, but that's something that I can reach out to a conservator and answer, get an answer for you. Sorry, Clark. <laughs> All right. So Kathy, who was asking about the photo storage earlier, uh, has a follow-up. So is it bad, bad to have an acid-free box with three by five photos in acid-free packs? She got a kit from Archival and they say the boxes hold up to 200 or so photos. No, that's Perfect. That's fine. As long as um, if you can to separate the images in using the interleaving tissue. If not, the fact that there's an acid-free box and it's inside that box and it's um, protected is should be good enough. Uh, Janet would like some photo taking tips. She finds it hard to take photos and not get glare. Okay, try removing your um, try taking out the, um, oh gosh, the flash. Try using natural light. I know natural light is not good, but it, it wouldn't harm a photo if you took it in natural light for a minimal amount of time. So it's just, a, it's a matter of the amount of time of exposure that's an issue. So if you use natural lighting, that should probably help, but re minimize that though. Don't, don't leave them out too long in sunlight. Tracy says, thank you, Michelle. Kathy says, great talk, lots of practical info. And she says, thank God, thanks, Michelle. I assume she's referring to her archival boxes not being a waste. Uh, and then from D, she asks, or they ask, does the homestead find it has too many items and not enough space for storage? I learned that only 10% of museum items in the world are able to be displayed at one time, leaving sufficient storage a problem. I wouldn't say we have a problem with space, um, but what we try to remedy the um, issue of um, objects being put out on exhibit, that's, that's, a, that's, that's tough, but we do um, have a particular system of object rotation, so exhibit rotations. Um, and what we try to do is make our collection available to everybody. So whether it's researchers um, who are researching their, their own history or academic researchers, or we reach out or people reach out to us to um, have some of our objects on, on loan to another institution for exhibits. So we try various different ways to combat that we have objects and they just sit there. We don't, we're very active in trying to get our collection out there. Not, I know not many institutions do that, but we are 
one of those institutions that really tr strive to make our collection accessible to the communities um, for research and for exhibit uh, exhibition, whether they're ours or for other folks out there. All right, I currently don't have any more questions, but I'm gonna give you guys a couple more minutes in case you're still typing them out. But while we do, I wanted to point out our upcoming programs that are coming up. These will all be digital. So it will happen similar to how you are experiencing this today. Uh, I do see one last question from Steven about his photo. Um, I just wanna let you know that our museum does not go up to World War II. Our time period ends in 1929. So uh, you might wanna find a more appropriate museum for World War II things. All right, and let's see, we have a question from Anne coming in. She asks, can you store newspaper articles in the same type of acid-free envelope? Yes, yes you can. Um, you can store um, newspaper articles in acid-free envelopes. The only problem is um, something that is called inherent vice is an issue. So what is inherent vice? It means that the, during the process of its um, creation, whether it's a paper object or photo, um, paper and photo, there is something to be said in the process in which it was made that creates an adverse reaction to it. So, uh, so for instance, more specifically, newspapers are one of the most acidic type of papers that are around. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, newspapers need to be generated and created in mass quantities. So a newspaper folk who create, manufacture these, print out these newspapers, whether if it was in the past or in the present, use the most cheapest type of paper. And the cheap type of paper has a lot of wood pulp in it. The wood pulp that is naturally occurring from the source of paper. And it's not removed, so it's not linen free, it's not acid free, so they're highly acidic. And those are the ones that tend to degrade the most and discolor the most. You see yellowing and browning the most. But if you do put them in an acid free folder, that should stop the rapid deterioration. Um, but there is hope because we at the homestead have a collection of newspapers that are over a hundred years old and some are in good shape, some are in not the best shape, but if you do store them again in a stable environment, temperature, humidity wise, acid free folders, then you're, you're good. It should help. Oh, sorry, Stephen, I misunderstood your question. Um, he's actually asking if he wants to donate to another museum, should he contact the curator directly or is there like someone else he should contact? I would uh, contact the curator directly, the person in charge of the collection, and then it's their um, call whether they need to inform their uh, director or not. But I would try to contact the person in charge of the collection. And just to note, if you have World War II items, uh, World War II era items, and specifically if it, if it covers um, World War II, not just World War II era, there is a museum in San Diego called the Military History Museum. And they have a plethora of, of objects that talk about um, the United States history in terms of wars that we have been involved in. So I'm pretty sure they would welcome or at least talk to you about your collection if it's World War II era. And specifically, if those, if it's images or papers relating to the war, I'm pretty sure they would be open to talk to you. But again, I, I'm not sure. I would contact their, um, their curator. Uh, Kathy asks, special pencils to write on the back of photos, yes? Yes, very good question. Thank you, Kathy. I forgot to mention this. Um, uh, special pencils would be number one pencil. Always go with the number one pencil. They're harder to find like in stores physically, but you can easily find them online in Amazon. And I would go with Ticonderoga number one pencils simply because they have been around and they're really great quality pencils. But number one pencils, the reason why number one and not number two is because number one has a softer lead and it's more gentle on the surface when you're writing on a photograph on the back of a photo. So number one pencil. 
And then uh, Tracy asks, do you have any plans to do a curatorial uh, virtual workshop, maybe showcase an object or photo or two from the collection? She's also interested, if I remember correctly, in seeing a virtual tour of the West Wing. That is certainly something that um, uh, we can talk about um, at the homestead, um, but I wouldn't say that that's not something that um, is, it's not impossible. I think that's something really cool to suggest. And I think we have talked about something like that before as a staff in terms of the museum professional staffing. So great question and that could be in the works. So stay tuned. <laughs> and then Kathy just advises, don't press too hard with your pencil. Yes, please don't press too hard with your pencil and number one pencil. <laughs> All right, I have no more questions coming in. Uh, I've got some thank yous from Janet and Allison. Um, once again, if you have further questions, you may email Michelle. If you missed part of this program, it will be available online later this week. And if you have any other questions that are more general, you're welcome to email me at my email at i.qan at homesteadmuseum.org. And I'm going to turn it over to Michelle one last time for any last goodbyes and comments. So I would just like to say thank you all so very much for attending the workshop today. Um, I hope it was informative um, and that it actually gave you some food for thought. And remember that you are doing the best you can based on what you know and you have good intentions. So if you during the course of this workshop think, oh gosh, I've been doing this all wrong. Don't worry. It's, it's not too late. Um, and remember, you're doing the best you can. And, and please feel free to pick my brain, so to speak. Uh, email me with your questions and I'll be very happy to help you. And again, thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend as best you can. <laughs>